Hello and welcome to Bake More Pies Law of Relevancy podcast. Our guarantee is that you're going to learn at least one thing from our marketing industry experts that will make your life and your career better today and, of course, help you stay more relevant. I'm Cord Owen and I'm the president of Bake More Pies, a full service marketing agency in Tampa, Florida. Today I'm joined by Ben Tamlin, the director of communications for Microsoft. Hi, Ben. How are you? I'm good, Coach. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate you joining us today on the uh, the podcast. Yeah, no problem at all. Looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I would love for our audience, I'm sure they're very interested to hear a little bit about you and your background. Um, could you give us a little bit of uh, an overview about yourself and your career and uh, in storytelling? Yeah, so I've, I've had the luxury and, and frankly the privilege of working at, uh, at a small software startup from Redmond, Washington for about 15 years now. Um, and, you know, my role, I guess, in essence, has changed quite a lot in terms of what it is that I, uh, what it is that I do. Um, I've probably done like the best part of 10 to 12 different roles at Microsoft, everything from engineering roles to marketing roles, to chief of staff roles, um, to the role that, um, the role that I'm now in, um, which is really around focusing on uh, a lot of our communications work. Um, often that's done through the voice uh, of the CEO. Um, but I think the one thing that has probably been relatively pervasive throughout each and every one of those roles is that, um, you know, our role as, our role as employees, our role as human beings is to, you know, in essence, identify, curate and publish um, you know, rich and compelling stories about not only who we are as individuals, but the, 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 the people we work with and interact with every day. Um, and so a big part of my role at Microsoft is to be able to show the human impact of the technology that we work with every day. That's that's fantastic. Uh, speaking of human impact, we did a little bit of uh, research on you, a little Googling okay. or, or binging rather. Sorry about that. I don't want to offend. Um, yeah. And uh, we saw that, uh, that uh, there's a Ben Tamlin that really loves to hike. A lot of times right. when uh, when people go, is that is that the same Ben Tamlin? Sure. It is. It is the same band, Tamlin. Yeah. Uh, any chance I get, I, uh, I try and I try and get out and, uh, and, and, and hike. And I think the, the beauty of living in Washington state is that um, yeah, it's a pretty rich environment. If you want to go and hike a mountain, uh, I can literally walk out my, uh, my front door and within five minutes I can be, uh, I can be on a hiking trail. Well, uh, the maps that we saw were all the way from Arizona up to British Columbia. It looks like you've been all, all right. over the West coast. Yeah, I uh, I try and get out when I can. I think um, while there's some incredible hiking here in Washington State, um, you know, right up that corridor, uh, in essence, along the Pacific Crest Trail, is uh, there's a huge amount of incredible hiking. Um, so I managed to spend a week in uh, Banff um, just over the summertime, um, and I typically try and get down to Arizona at least at least once a year, um, especially around areas like Sedona. Um, it's just not only is the weather great, but uh, the hiking and the scenery is just, it's out of this world. It's like being on the moon. It's just phenomenal. Well, the, the humidity is very low, isn't it? So you can see forever, right? And yeah. And, for the, you know, the humidity, it's it's a very dry heat, much like I grew up with when I grew up in Australia. Um, so to a certain extent, it's a little bit like going home. It's as close as you can get to going home from a weather perspective in, in the United States. So anywhere around Nevada or Arizona is generally pretty good. Good deal. Good deal. So and yeah, let's get into uh, storytelling a little bit. Sure. So sounds great. Uh, one of the things that uh, that we, you know, as marketers know, is that storytelling for most brands is more than just putting interesting content on social media. How do you put sure. together uh, a complete brand storytelling uh, plan? I mean, I think a lot of it it sort of starts first and foremost, and I think this is where, you know, in some cases, uh, I think people perhaps overestimate how significant challenge is, but I think it starts with, it starts with audience. Um, and I think often we think about, um, when we think about this notion of storytelling, we think about it purely as a, as a marketing technique. And I think, you know, to a certain extent, the, the concept and notion of being able to tell stories exists far beyond trying to sell a product. Um, I think if you look at every single person, um, at a company like Microsoft, you can typically plot them um, on a continuum. And at one end of that continuum, you've got 
a handful of people that are selling the value of who we are as a company. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you've got people that um, are here to sell and create incredible products that hopefully have the kind of impact that um, allow every single person in the, on, the, on the planet to actually achieve something. And what I think we often forget is that you know, in order to be able to sell a product, regardless of which company you work for, you, you need to first and foremost sell the value of who you are as a company. Um, and I think it's one of the things from a marketing perspective that I think for the most part, not just Microsoft, but I think an entire industry of marketers is just starting to work out. Um, anyone that's done even a base level marketing class at business school was probably taught that there are four Ps to the marketing mix. It's product, price, place, and promotion. And I think one of the things that's emerged more so over the last five years or so is that there's actually a fifth P yeah. um, that in many cases probably, well, it's actually not people, it's actually purpose. Oh, wow, purpose. Maybe there's six. And and, and I think, but I, I think the, the beauty of people is people kind of runs runs along the gamut of all, all of those five. But the, the simple reality is, is that the importance of purpose, um, it begins to define who you are as a company. And once you can begin to start to very, very clearly define who you are as a company, you not only sell the value of who you are, but you then earn yourself the opportunity and the right to maybe sell some product later on, later on in the future, um, which is ultimately how we create things like shareholder value and return on investment and profitability and those kinds of things. But in order to get there, I think more and more uh, organizations are needing to be far more purpose-driven than they have been in the past. And storytelling plays a huge role in being able to educate people not just about who you are, not just about who you are as a company, um, but how you're ultimately going to help. Gotcha. So uh, I remember when I first started in marketing, uh, when I was in college 20 years ago, and learning about uh, what we call storytelling today, they used to just call it branding. Yeah. Right. And it seems like it's a lot more specific now, and, and segmentation is really, really important. I read a little bit about um, your process, about how you put together keynote. Uh, presentations mm. for different audiences. How how important is yeah. segmentation when it comes to storytelling? I think being able to identify the specific niches in which you are, in which you're trying to target, I think become important. You have to be very very clear on who your audience is. One of the questions I think we often ask, and and we've even gone down to the point of, we will create unique personas. We will be very very clear on not only who we're talking to, but we want to know also what what they look like. So whether or not, whether we're creating uh, a keynote that perhaps goes on stage at a large event, um, or whether we're creating a new narrative that helps define, uh, you know, Microsoft's innovation strategy, we are, we will go to the point where we will be very, very clear in terms of who this person is, what age they are, what their demographic information looks like, where they grew up, what their political affiliation is, whether or not they're, uh, um, where they where they grew up are they college educated um, and once you begin to start to get to that detail you begin to use that frame of reference so that anything that you create from a marketing standpoint you can begin to test against that persona and go hey is this something that john from chicago or mary from detroit are they really going to buy this are they really going to believe what we're actually selling um and so i think once you actually once you actually get to a place where you can clearly define not only who your audience is, but what their likes and preferences are, then you can begin to really start to tap into their unique psyche and hopefully then create something that is, that is ultimately relevant for everyone. So you brought up a, a very important word just now and you talked about, uh, you just said, we're going to start testing the story. So how do you go about testing a story? How do, how do you guys do it? A big part of it for me, I think, and this kind of comes down to how, how we sort of think about storytelling. I think often we think about storytelling in a, in, in, in a re relatively one-dimensional frame. Um, we're creating a story that's designed for digital, or we're creating a story that is designed to deliver, be, to be delivered as part of a, part of a keynote uh, on stage. Um, and it's relatively limiting because what we what we what we tend to do is we tend to forget about the other parts of the marketing capability that we have, um, and that, that we can begin to start to tap into. So, as a good example, a few years ago, we we were writing a story about um, uh, part of Microsoft's business called the Human Factors Lab, 
And in essence, what this what this group does is that they do a huge amount of usability testing, primarily on hardware. So they will take a product like HoloLens as an example, um, and they will force people to wear this HoloLens over a period of time and begin to start to realize and rationalize, hey, how long is it that people can begin to wear this on their head before it starts to get too heavy or a little bit uncomfortable? I mean, once you start to understand what that threshold is, you can begin to start to do some really quite interesting things in terms of product design and so forth. Um, the other thing that they have in this human factors lab is this incredible um, anechoic chamber. Um, and anechoic by its nature means there's no echo. Um, and we use this often to test things like voice enabled assistance, things like Cortana or Siri and so forth. And as we were chatting with the person that runs this anechoic chamber, um, he sort of mentioned in, in a relatively off, off the cuff kind of way that he, he had a s suspicion that this might actually be the quietest place on earth. Um, and I remember saying to him at the time, like, well, what, what makes the most quiet? What's the, give me, give me a reference. Because when you tell me it's quiet, like I, I don't even, I don't even know what, what quiet is. And he says, look, you know, if you were to take this chamber and we were to drop it um, in the middle of century link field, just where the Seahawks play, it's typically known as being a relatively loud football stadium. Right. Uh, we could close the door and at its highest possible rate, you wouldn't be able to hear a damn thing. Um, and it prompted us to kind of look at this and go, okay, well, look, what what would it look like if we got the Guinness Book of World Records to come out and actually test whether or not this is in fact the, the world's quietest place? Um, and in essence, the story then sort of took on a little bit of a life of its own because not only were we telling this incredible story about the people behind this amazing lab that you know was relatively, I guess, undiscovered for most people that even follow Microsoft, even to some employees. Sure. Um, but you know, we now have the opportunity potentially to go and try and see if we can break a world record. Um, turns out it is my, it is the most quiet place in the world in world in the world. Um, and we ended up doing uh, not only a large digital um, story on top of that, but the amount of press pickup that happened as a result. Um, it even actually this and this really surprised us. It's um, it even managed to end up on Saturday Night Live the following week after we actually published the story. Um, it was actually part of their, uh, their weekend update. Um, and there was a very, very lame joke that was told. I think it was something along the lines of, you know, Microsoft announced this week that they have the world's most quietest, the world's quietest place. Uh, and here we were thinking it was Dodger Stadium. Um, so the joke itself <laughs> wasn't great. But, you know, all of a sudden you begin to start to think, wow, you know, here's a piece of content that we've created. Um, and now all of a sudden it's being embedded into you know, a cultural icon like Saturday Night Live and you begin to start to think, wow, you know, all of a sudden the story begins to start to take it, take take on a, a legs of its own. And it's once you start to get into this notion of sort of true integrated marketing and true integrated storytelling or 360 degree storytelling where you're using multiple communication channels to begin to start to tell that one story from a variety of different angles, then you start to tap into those unique niches and sort of say, hey, well, the story I'm telling through this medium is designed for the person I talked about from Detroit. And this particular story, this, which is in essence the same story, is being told from a slightly different vantage point, and that's designed to tap into a slightly different niche. Then you start to get to a place where you can really kind of create some, some amazing marketing scale. Sure. So can we can we help? Um, so one thing, um, if 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 the in, if you're in the audience, you don't know what an anechoic chamber is. Uh, it it's one of these rooms where there's uh, the floor is suspended above. You're surrounded by foam. The foam is three to four feet thick. It's amazing. Uh, a lot of times, people uh, when they get in these these chambers, you can hear your own heartbeat. It's extremely uh, quiet and. Uh, I'm assuming that they've been, and help me understand, I'm assuming that the connection is by explaining that you've achieved this technology, this technology of being able to create this world's most quietest place that it maybe yeah. translates over into the Microsoft products and uh, sure. to help show that, hey, you know, this is our standard. You know, we're, we're going for the best in the world. Yeah, I mean, look, a big part of that is about being able to then create products. And as I said, many of them are voice enabled. So our ability to be able to, listen for tonality changes or changes in the way in which people talk, uh, perhaps from region to region across the United States or, or at a global level. 
by testing that in these kinds of environments, we can begin to start to pinpoint um, not only the way in which people talk, but more importantly, the way in which a computer interpret, interprets that speech. Um, so whether it's for helping with things like real-time translation, uh, or whether it's helping uh, a digital assistant better understand the request that you're making, um, you can begin to do some really quite amazing things. Sure, absolutely. I remember when, uh, when voice um, uh, got to be really used by a lot of people is when it became, when it actually started to work, <laughs> you know, it's like when it was a kludgy or, or, or a little bit tricky to make it work, you know, there really wasn't that much adoption. So being able to tune it in and make it really effective, that's what, a, what right. powers adoption. So speaking of voice, is voice one of those channels that you see growing in the, you know, hugely in the next few years? And what, what do you mean by voice? Cause... So in, in voice in regards to Siri, Alexa, um, I heard about a year ago that um, Alexa became the world's third largest search engine. Um, cool. And, you know, with people asking Alexa for, di for different things, uh, you know, using full sentences to, for their queries instead of just a, a combination of keywords like they do in a search engine, that full text yes. search is becoming really popular. Yeah, look, I, I think from I think we're just we're we're at a we're at an interesting inflection point right now as we, as we sort of think about voice. Voice is something that has been around for, gosh, probably the best part of almost fifteen years now, ten to fifteen years now, and we're only now just starting to begin to really understand the capabilities of what you can do with voice. And part of it's natural language, which is what you just described. The we still speak to digital assistants in a way that is. Is, is not only very formal, but it's not conversational in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, and so we've got to begin to start to get to a place where we can begin to start to do that. I think the second part, which, and this is where I think that there is incredible opportunity and incredible opportunity for innovation is the idea that any one assistant is ultimately going to be the be all and end all um, I think is crazy. Um, and, I, and, and I'll give you just a, a very, very simple example. Um, one, of the, one of the few places that we are unable to be productive right now for a really good reason is, is when you're in the car. Um, you know, we don't, want, we don't want people checking email or text messaging <laughs> or right on Tinder um, for a very good reason. Like you're driving an automobile. Yeah, it can be a little hazardous. Uh, it's it's pretty hazardous, right? And and in most and in most places, um, it's against the law. Um, but what if you could use your voice um, in much the same way? Like, let's say I'm able to jump in the car, and let's say I want to buy a new pair of trainers, um, and so I jump onto, uh, I ask a digital assistant like Cortana, I sort of say, "Hey, Cortana, can you go and find me a pair of size 11 uh, Adidas?" Uh, Yeezy sneakers. Um, I want you to check the. F ch I, I, I want you to go out onto the internet, check a bunch of sites. Um, I want you to check the uh, balance of my credit card account, assuming you can find a pair of these sneakers. Uh, I want to be able to track delivery, um, and I want to know when that arrives on. When that arrives next week, and ensure that. Um, that I can let the delivery driver into my house to drop off the sneakers because I don't want these set outside on the porch. Now, I want to be able to talk to a digital assistant like that. And what I'm doing, like, and I, I created a scenario that is one familiar but intentionally complex, but I'm asking a digital assistant to go out and in essence, scour the internet. It already knows my shoe size. Um, it knows it has to go out to my bank and check whether or not my credit card has enough funds in it to be able to pay for these trainers. It's then fulfilling another request from someone like UPS to be able to track the package. Um, it's then going back to the bank to allow me to pay for it. It's then ensuring that the person can actually enter my place where I physically live, drop that off and then provide me with a bunch of video communication and feedback to ensure that it happens. So I'm intentionally hitting about a dozen different services. And the way, and, a, and ex, you know, the way that typically works today is that uh, I would need to ask Siri a question. I would then need to go and ask another service, another question. In essence, 
where I think a lot of these digital assistants will evolve to is that they will be aggregators of information. Um, and in essence, what we want to be able to do, and a big part of the work that Microsoft's doing is, in essence, allowing any company to create their own digital assistant. Wow. Um, and you know, to a certain extent, we will work hard to act as an aggregator to begin to connect all of these assistants together in really interesting and unique ways so that it is a friction-free environment for the person sure. that is sat in that car trying to order a new pair of trainers. Well, that's one thing I've always been very grateful about with Microsoft is that um, I know that security, you know, the scenario that you just described would require a pretty, you know, strict level of security in order to get that done. And I don't want to just trust any old company, especially one that gets all its revenue from advertising, <laughs> you know, to have access to all of my accounts. So that's one where I would definitely trust Microsoft more than the others. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and security needs to be first and first and foremost like the scenario that i just described is as fabricated as that was doesn't work um without you having full trust and transparency not only into the process um but ensuring that every single part of that trend every single part of that conversation every single part of the transaction that's supported by that conversation is grounded in a set of security principles that ensure that my information and me physically is always safe that's cool so if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of get back a little bit more to uh, communications and and how uh, obviously you're you're doing it at a very elite level. Right now, a lot of the work it's very we nice, do very nice of you to say yeah. that. I, I I don't know if that's true, but I well, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, l let's just say uh, let's say it's true in that you have an incredible amount of responsibility. I mean, you're in charge of the communications for the CEO of Microsoft. I mean, that's that's one of the largest companies in the whole world. That's a lot of responsibility you've got there, Ben. Yeah, I look, and, and thankfully, there is a, a huge number of people that are sort of working very, very closely um, with me and that I work for as well. Um, so it's not something that's solely my responsibility. I can assure you of that. There is a huge team of incredibly talented uh, communications, marketing people and operations folks that, um, that do an incredible job to make that a reality. Um, but but make no mistake, like it is something that... Um, uh, you know, we work very, very hard on. We we see incredible value in ensuring that um, you know the way in which we communicate the messages that we have to communicate are done in a way that not only resonates with the unique audiences that we have, but um, also ensure that um, you know as a company um, we're able to lead with that uh, with that sort of purpose driven, mission driven approach that we've been talking about for probably five or six years now. So getting so then getting back to purpose. Um, mm. uh, our, so for example, our agency is very digital. Um, and so a lot of times we lead with digital because it's, uh, it's highly trackable. We're very accountable to the results and things like that. Um, do you guys, when you're putting together a, a plan, I mean, obviously traditional is still a fantastic medium for a lot of, uh, types of communications, right? Whether it's, it's earned or unearned. Do you, mm. when you're putting together those campaigns, is there a time, I mean, because we have a lot of communications professionals who are listening to this podcast. Um, yeah. Is there a time when you guys, or is there a process that you have that helps you understand the mix of channels that you're going to use? Yeah, I mean, look, I think part of it comes down to, part of it comes down to what are you, what are you trying to change? Um, and you're right, like the beauty of digital is that it's, it's easily measured. Um, I, I think sometimes maybe too, too measured. Um, I, I often talk about this notion of vanity metrics. Um, you, get, you know, there's this old, old saying, like if you could, um, you know, I could paint the Sistine Chapel tomorrow, but a, a, a cat video would get more likes. Um, and, and the reality is, is that, um, you know, we, we, we measure some of those vanity metrics too. We think about things like uh, page views and page hits and uh, dwell time and all of, the, all of that fun stuff. Um, I think the more important metric is being able to understand, hey, and again, this, you can only do this in isolation. You can only do this after the fact, which is, hey, am I actually changing the perception of who we are as a company? Um, and you can only do that by 
looking back three or four years on. Um, you can't look at it over a single campaign. And that's where I think it frustrates a lot of marketers is that um, you know, any, any marketing manager, any leader of a marketing organization, if the first question they're asking is, um, uh, is a return on investment question, like why should I invest in this if I can't see a return on it in, a, in this particular period of time, I, I would question whether or not they're measuring the right stuff. So then from um, a storytelling perspective, especially when it comes to storytelling, like if we're talking about e-commerce, it, the mm-hmm. ROI is something that we'd want to see very, very quickly, right? Sure. Um, but if we're talking about storytelling, it sounds to me like your advice to the storytelling professionals is to set expectations that they're going to be more long-term to the people they're reporting to. I, I think they have. I think they have to be. Um, I think they have to be. Um, you, you know, five or six years ago, um, Microsoft talked about the importance. Sorry, fifteen or sixteen years ago. Uh, Microsoft began this journey uh, to become, in essence, a cloud-based company where we had this perception and this belief that the future of technology would ultimately be predicated on an organization's success in order to be, to be able to deliver uh, a set of services that were built, built and designed for the cloud. And at the time, uh, I remember there was a huge number of people, both customers, partners, you name it, who were looking at this with incredible skepticism. How are you going to do it? Why do you think you're better at managing the security, uh, the, the inherent security issues that go along with it? Is it going to ensure that I no longer have a job because you're going to manage all of this stuff for, for our customers? And the, the reality is, is it's taken 15 years for us to truly change perception. Um, had we not invested in that 15 years ago, I have no doubt we would not be in the place that we're in today. Um, and the same is true of every other technology company. Um, and so it's, you can only begin to start to look at that over, over a longer time horizon. I think we, I think as marketers, I think we're, we're often very impatient because we expect results and we respect results in a very, very short time horizon. And the reality is, is that anything worth building is going to take time. Um, and so you need to be able to look at it across multiple different time horizons. Sure, you're going to measure the short term stuff because you still want to measure it. It's still important. If, you're, if, you're, if your communication strategy or your storytelling strategy or your marketing strategy is not working, you want to know that it's broken early enough so that you can pivot and fix it. So how do we um, do that? How do we tell, how do we tell, what are the KPIs we're looking for to know that whether or not our storytelling strategy is broken early on? Well, I mean, the, 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 the net, if, if people are not reading your stuff, I think that's a gotcha. pretty... So engagement. Point. Yeah, so engagement is important. Now, as I said before, there's some, there's some BS metrics around this. Like if I think about how people actually measure uh, page views, you know, if you've clicked on a page view, like let's say I write a story that's a thousand words and someone clicks on that page and they spend three seconds on it. We count that as a page view. Now I know for a fact, right. they haven't read a damn thing. Um, and, you know, so, and this is where, you know, this is where measurement can be, can become a problem. Yeah. Because we look at that, think about, wow, you know what, we've had a thousand, we've had a thousand percent uplift on, uh, uh, on, the, on the stories that we created month over month. Okay, how, what's the average time they're actually spending on the story? Well, funnily enough, that's actually gone down. It was six seconds and now it's two seconds. I'm like, okay, well, they weren't reading them a month ago. They're certainly not reading them now. Um, so that's actually, that's actually, that for me would be a, a good example of concern. If, you're, if all of a sudden people are starting to spend longer on your site or longer on your story, that would be a good example of a leading metric that, hey, the content I'm creating is beginning to resonate. Um, and it's resonating in a way that with this particular demographic, because we can do some really quite sophisticated work just out of the box in terms of understanding not only who's coming to, who's coming to the digital asset that we're creating um, and when they're coming, uh, but we can also have we can also now predict how long they're staying. Um, so once you begin to start to combine that, I think you can get a pretty good sense of, um, of, of what's happening. The other one, and, and again, this is a very very simple exercise. Um, you get a pretty good sense through social media, uh, Twitter. Uh, to a lesser extent, Facebook, um, about what what the perception of the work that you're doing is. If people are sharing this, you know that that's a pretty good early indication. Sure. Uh, people like the content we've got. So shares are worth more than likes. Yeah, because this is the thing: is that you even if you have a even if you have a well a clearly even if you have a relatively small group of 
uh, highly influential people. If highly influential people are sharing that content, you, you can see the exponential growth that comes along with it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and highly influential people in some of the work that we've done, uh, working with influencers, it, a lot of times for those people to even share something, it has to be consistent with their own story. Of course. You know, in their absolutely. own brand. And, and it's it's they are the most conservative about sharing things. And so right. I, I agree with you 100 percent. If you can break through that, you know, that wall of, of, of their story, their own brand and help them tell and enhance their brand. I think that's really powerful. One of one final story I'd love to get some insight or maybe share with the audience yeah. is um, from your, I was at Digital Summit, then when mm -hmm. it was here in Tampa and really enjoyed it. Um, I saw this guy from across the, uh, from across the lunchroom. He looked like he was off of uh, the show, like the movie Mad Max. And I was like, who okay. is that guy? And and then uh, we went into the keynote uh, for the first day, and here comes you walking up on stage. I look like Mad Max. Wow, that's <laughs> you had, interesting. You had Thank like you. this I satchel. I guess. Yeah, it looked like you just rode in on a on one of those bike motorcycles with the sidecar. <laughs> it was, but anyhow, uh, but uh, no, it was really really cool. You looked a lot like a badass, you know, like going around the. Um, but anyhow, one of the stories I really enjoyed from your from your presentation was the that device that uh, that went on that young lady's wrist mm -hmm. with the trimmers, and I thought yeah. that that was a really good story. Could you tell us a little bit about yeah. that uh, before we go? Just help us understand how that, from a communications perspective, give us a little bit yeah. of, of information about that campaign. Yeah. So I mean, this this is this is one that's near and dear to my heart. I had. Um, I had seen uh, there was a reality TV show that was actually done in the UK um, by the BBC. Uh, it was called The Big Life Fix. And the basic premise of the show was that they would bring together a handful of computer scientists, researchers um, to work on specific societal problems. Um, and it was done at a at a relatively microeconomic level. Like, you know, it's not like you're going to get a bunch of scientists on and say, hey, over the next three days, we're going to perform this experiment and we're going to solve global warming because we all know that that would be ridiculous. Um, but the basic premise of this was that um, they had identified a graphic designer uh, um, who was based in London, uh, a woman by the name of Emma Lawton. Um, at the time, she was 32 years old um, and had been diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's disease. Um, and to be to be given that diagnosis at that age is is tough enough in its own right. But when you're a graphic designer, um, yeah, you know, I think your entire livelihood, your entire livelihood, right? Um, and they had paired her up with um, a researcher from Microsoft in Cambridge, um, a woman by the name of Haiyan Zhang, um, who was originally of Chinese descent, but grew up in, actually grew up in my hometown in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and I had seen this, um, I had seen a clip of, of what they'd done, but in essence, what Haiyan was able to do was She'd done a huge amount of testing and research. She just wanted to be able to allow someone like Emma to gain a greater level of independence by being able to write again. Um, obviously, with the tremors, um, it made it very difficult even to do something as simple as signing your name. And she was able to work out that if she could create something that vibrated, in essence, in exact opposition to the tremor, what you could actually do is you could all of a sudden create this level of stability in the hand that would allow you to do, you know, what you and I would take for granted as being something very, very simple, like signing a name or, uh, or drawing a box. Um, and in essence, what she did was she cre she was able to use these, these coin cell motors um, that would vibrate um, in opposition to the tremors. Um, and in essence, package it up as a watch. Um, that would con constantly vibrate, constantly move um, to make a task like, um, like writing or even 
very, very simple graphic design, a hell of a lot easier. Um, and as you saw in the video, um, the, the impact that had, not just on Emma, but I think on every single person that's seen that video, um, you know, it's quite a visceral reaction. Um, and I think a big part of Microsoft's mission in terms of being able to enable every single person and organization on the planet to achieve more is, is really embedded in these kinds of stories. Um, sure. And it's this kind of technology that I think, you know, you hear a lot of, you hear a lot of people talking about how technology is going to change the world and we're going to change the world. And this is our mission to change the world. And it's, it's become, it's become a bit of a catchphrase, not necessarily in a good way. Um, but for me, this was a really good example of, Hey, this is when we're creating this kind of purpose driven technology, this truly does have the ability to change the way, change, change people's worldview in truly dramatic and amazing ways. Um, and by being able to create, in essence, a prototype watch that Emma could wear and wear consistent, um, I think she'd be the first person to say, like, this is, you know, when we talk about technology, uh, the opportunity that we have with technology and the responsibility that comes along with that, um, you know, for me, it's the, it's the best possible example of uh, technology truly serving the people in our society versus the other way around. Right. I mean, I, I would agree with you 100 percent. I think that's incredible what you guys have done. I mean, when you have uh, really extremely creative, blessed people out there who have, you know, that kind of brain power to put the tools in their hands to be able to create something that can allow someone like Emma to use her hands. That's really yeah. powerful stuff. Well, Ben, I, I really appreciate you joining us today. No um, it's amazing to hear you know, your insights and perspective on the industry to help us, you know, stay relevant in our careers. You're doing some amazing work there at Microsoft. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. And then everybody, Wonderful. please don't uh, forget to share today's show. Stay tuned for the next episode. I'm Cord Zoen, President of Bakemore Pies. Thank you. <laughs>